Ah, ZL2 Oscar Zulu, ZL2 Charlie Tango Mike. Do you copy there, Wayne? Yeah, Roger, Roger. You're probably the same, actually. You're probably a five by seven. Just uh, signal starting to come through there. Just wanted to do a quick uh, radio check on this little rig. Um, how does it sound at your end, over? Yeah, Roger. Audio is good. Good. All right, Roger, Roger. Five by nine and sounding pretty good. Oh, that's good. Thanks, Wayne. Yeah, no, just uh, spent the last uh, month or so uh, sort of making up this little uh, homebrew QRP rig. Uh, did the first contact last night using a, uh, a different power amplifier configuration and uh, just doing another test tonight with a, um, with a, I guess, a simpler setup with the driver on the IRF 510. So putting out just on um, 5 watts. So very similar to yesterday, but a much um, simpler circuit. Um, I think I probably should be able to get a bit more out of this. I'm using an old laptop power supply which has 24 volts, but I suspect I'm probably nibbling in. Yeah, I don't know. It's uh, I find sometimes the old uh, RF power amplifier is a bit of a black art, sort of half half maths and half theory, and a little bit of um, a little bit of tweaking here and there and playing around. Um, but that's good. At least we're getting out, which is good. You had a good day there, Wayne. Back to you. I'll pause the video here and come back afterwards. Oh, I think I'll leave it Perfect. Excellent. No, that's great, thanks Wayne. I really appreciate that. I'm now in the, uh, the dilemma of thinking about what to do with this one. Do I um, package it up and put it into a, uh, a nice chassis or not? Um, I must admit I, uh, I like leaving them open so I can sort of look at all the individual components and, and sort of think about what role they're playing in the circuit, um, which, which I like. But clearly the radio performs probably better in a, in, a, in a metal chassis. But I've got another rig which I want to revisit, which has AGC and a whole lot of other little uh, knickknacks, which I think I might revisit that particular rig and then uh, look to mount that one in a, uh, a chassis. But uh, this this particular build here, the, the whole um, ethos, I guess, or the thrust was to build a rig using uh, commonly available parts. So uh, I've tried to stick away from anything w which I class as sort of exotic. So I've got a homebrew crystal filter, homebrew mixers. Um, stock standard sort of 3904 transistors, the RF510, so uh, you're just sort of trying to keep it as simple as possible. No AGC, no uh, automatic level control on the transmit, just a uh, just a, a simple little rig there. But um, I won't hold you up, um, thanks very much for coming back. Um, I might just sort of write this one up and start thinking about what to do next. Um, ZL2 Oscar Zulu, ZL2 Charlie Tanga Mike. Yeah, Roger, Roger, Wayne, thanks very much. Um, I'll try and make uh, the QRP net as well. Sometimes, the last couple of weeks, I've actually been out of town and had various things on and have missed it, but I'll, I'll certainly endeavour to uh, try and get on um, more often than I have been. Anyway, you have a good uh, evening and a good Sunday, and we'll definitely work again. ZL2 Oscar Zulu, ZL2 Charlie Tinger Mike, clear. Have a good night, cheers. Right, well that is good news. As you heard, a little bit of um, low signal, but... Uh, nice and clear with no distortion on the transmit signal, so more than happy with that. So, um, let me just sort of go through the changes from uh, yesterday, uh, without making anybody sick. Right, so, um, what's the best way of doing this? Let's just sort of go a little back from there and I can sort of talk about the circuit. So you recall yesterday I was using um, this amplifier here as the driver for the IRF 510, um, and I said that um, an itch that I wanted to scratch was to look at a, uh, a simple common emitter amplifier 
um, let me just come out a bit here. So using a, a 2N3904 and having the, the VCC sitting at 24 volts as opposed to 12, um, you can see if I can get a good sitting at 24 volts as opposed to 12 just to see if I could get um, a greater vo uh, amplitude voltage swing at this point to drive the RF510. Um, so this was the overall configuration I came up with. Um, exactly the same, bypassed on the emitter resistor and um, had an output transformer here. So the, the transformer I had out of the box um, had already had 20 turns on one of the on one of the turn, one of the um, the cores. So I thought, well, I'll leave it at 20 and then just play around with the uh, the secondary to get the best match, uh, which turned out to be 20 turns to 7 turns, and that's on an FT37-43. Um, other than that, it's just straight through into the RF510. So in terms of the 510, what did I change here? So the input side of the house is exactly the same, in through the 10 ohm resistor and 100 nanofarads into the gate of the 510. Um, on the... The, the, the biasing side, what I elected to do is I, I took out that 51 ohm resistor and just replaced it with an RFC, which um, you can probably just see it over in the back there, is, let me just, oh no, I'll keep this out because otherwise you can't see the, um, you can't see the schematic. Uh, replace it with uh, 10 turns on FT37-43, uh, no resistor there, so um, my thinking there is um, ignoring the capacitive reactants here, I'm just going to try and block any RF from going up into the biasing circuit and just sort of feed it all into, uh, from a voltage point of view, all into the uh, the gate. And that was quite a marked difference. I um, had a little uh, switching in and out the, the 51 ohm resistor and you can certainly see from an output uh, quite a, a significant difference. In the output circuit, um, a subtle change there, so now running straight into an RFC. In this particular case, the RFC is 10 turns on an FT50-43, so same material but a larger diameter. Uh, and my thinking there was you know, potentially more current um, to minimise any potential for overheating the core. Uh, I'd just go for a slightly larger size. Um, I, I, you know, I, I must admit I, I don't have enough experience to say that, well, you know, you're nowhere near overheating if you were to use a 37-43. But hey, I have in the box, so they're nice and easy to use. Uh, not doing any kind of impedance transforming at this point, I'm doing it over here and just running through those two 56 nanofarad capacitors and then into a, uh, a transformer that I was playing around with. Again using an FT50-43 and just notionally set the primary to six turns and just start playing around with uh, the secondary and the, uh, the best transfer in, in terms of the output signal was at 6 turns to 5 turns, which was, um, which was interesting. Now the amplifier itself at the moment is putting out um, just over 5 watts. Uh, I, I don't think that's right, and you would have heard me mention to Wayne on the radio that I do find sometimes the, the, the RF power amplifiers can be just a little bit of a, um, a black art sometimes. Yeah. Half theory and half sort of playing around trying to make things work. Because um, I initially thought that running the RF510 at 24 volts on the drain and having two amps available from the power supply, you know, that's what, 48 uh, watts. If I derate that down to say 40 watts available for the whole radio, and even if it's at 50% efficiency, um, I should be getting more than what I am, but I've uh, you know I've, I've I've tried all sorts of things in terms of impedance matching and the like, and I'm just wondering if I'm sort of starting to nibble up against the, the limitations of the of the 510. Um, but again, I, I I don't have enough experience, and I, I must actually do some more formal playing around, I guess, with with the power amplifier. But you know, in terms of a QRP rig, you can't go wrong. It's certainly on the uh, at 5 watts, um, it's it's nice and cool. This heatsink here, you can sort of see the little um, die marker there. It was a heatsink of a uh, an old computer microprocessor, and that was lying in the junk box. Just um, didn't bother. Just took off the fan that used to sit up here, and just used the um, use the uh, the heatsink there for uh, for the MOSFET. And, and and it's fine. It's stone cold. Well, when I say stone cold, it's certainly not hot. That's for sure. Yeah, so like I say, uh, my gut feeling is it should have been more than 5 watts, but um, I'll have to do some more digging around and playing. Okay, 
Um, in terms of some other general comments, sort of wrapping up this particular build and sort of thinking moving forward, um, there was uh, a question about um, the suitability or the usability or um, would it benefit from um, an AGC, automatic gain control on the receive. It, absolutely. Um, I personally have no problems uh, adjusting the volume for different um, receive strengths for signals coming through. Um, and again, f f the whole ethos of what I was thinking about right at the very beginning was to keep it simple. Um, and right or wrong, I decided to put um, luxuries such as automatic gain control and automatic level control on the transmit into the uh, the non-simplex or the, the complex bucket. Uh, again, right or wrong, but you know you have to have a design decision and some parameters at the beginning. So I just wanted to stick with a, a very vanilla, simple um, architecture for both the transmit and the receive. Uh, and I'd like to think I've achieved that um, in terms of what I set out to do. Um, you would have heard me mentioning to Wayne uh, thinking about what actually to do in terms of uh, mounting this. Um, I was going to make that a separate video but what I might do, I might just uh, bring this camera back a bit and just give me a couple of seconds and I'll bring down this rig here. So this is a, um, a rig that goes back a while and it was a dual band rig running on 80 and 40 and oops, that's it. That's it. Oh, shucks, not doing very well tonight am I? Sorry about that. What I might do is put the cover back on the light because I think it, it glares a little bit too much on the uh, on the copper. Anyway, what I was what I was going to say, um, this radio here, it was a bit of an experiment and a play around with um, AGC. So there's an AGC amplifier here, which is um, varying this particular second IF amp on the receive side and on the transmit. I um, I didn't actually implement, but I was thinking about implementing automatic level control. Um, it's got all sorts of you know, other aspects such as um, a little an RC oscillator here to do tone injection for tuning up uh, and the like. So I'm just sort of debating now between the two of them which is the best candidate to uh, pull apart and to mount into a, a chassis. Uh, I've got a spare receiver chassis which um, in a previous video I showed that I was thinking about mounting a radio into. So I'm sort of just debating if I want to revisit this whole rig here, go back through it. Um, I think, as you can see here in the central strip here, we've got the receive um, side here, um, IF amp one. In fact, there goes our um, first mixer, first IF amp, crystal filter, second IF amp, amp and our uh, uh, product detector before going to the audio amp. And on the transmit side, back through again. Balance modulator here. First IF amp on the transmit side through the same crystal filter through switching relays. Second IF filter uh, into our um, second oscillator, say again our second mixer that is, where it's brought up to the transmit frequency uh, and out through the power amplifier. Um, I think with my current setup by having, uh, by switching over the VFO and the BFO between transmit and receive, I can certainly simplify that circuit. The downside of course is that I potentially, it becomes more complex from an AGC and an ALC point of view. Potentially. Um, for example, one option could be if I was to go with a, a single or just two IF amps serving both transmit and receive, is for the um, receiver AGC here on transmit, it just gets set to a set level, at a set level of gain for that particular IF amp and just remove all AGC aspects. So that wouldn't be hard to do with just a simple diode switch. So um, maybe that's probably a, not a bad way of doing it. And then maybe on the second IF amp or on the uh, the driver, uh, potentially introduce some ALC. I, I don't know. Um, but it has always sort of been on my uh, on my list of things to do to, to revisit this particular radio. Um, but it worked well at the time, and, and still does. I just, uh, I'm just wondering if this is a, a better candidate to, um, to, to mount. Um, having said that, if I go back to this radio over here, if you can sort of see at the same time, um, what I do like about the radio we just finished is that I've sort of gone away, f well not gone away, that um, it's, it's got a whole lot more homebrew components. 
the crystal filter as opposed to a commercial filter like this one. Um, the home brew uh, mixes as opposed to the, the SBL ones here. Um, and you know, I can only go by the received signal report and if people are saying that it sounds great, then um, I'm, I'm, you know, as far as I'm concerned, I'm quite happy with, with, with the way that's working for what I like out of radios. So, you know, there's some, some merit in maybe sticking with this one and, and making that package, that one up, being more sort of um, home brew. I don't know. Um, I'd be, you know, I'm sort of happy to take some input there if people have got a, a preference of uh, one way or another. Anyway, okay, so I have um, rambled long enough. So I've covered what I did today with the, um, the RF510 and its change in configuration. Um, I've covered the, uh, the much simpler, way simpler um, driver circuit as opposed to this one here. Um, so if I was to use a, a, a MOSFET in the future, I'd certainly be looking to use something like this, um, just purely from a simplicity uh, point of view. And just briefly spoken about sort of what to do next in terms of um, revisiting this or, or mounting. Anyway, I will say 73 there, stay safe, and I'll do some more mulling. Um, feel free to leave a comment, and I shall see you next time. Cheers all.